It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, it's Professor Zeynep Ajan. Uh, she is the Koch Holding Chair of Management and Strategy with a dual appointment of Department of Psychology and Faculty of Management. Uh, Koch University is in Turkey in Istanbul. Uh, Zeynep is the founder and academic director of the leadership lab at Koch University. You will be able to find a link to it if you uh, look through her bio, which is posted in the event announcement. Um, Zeynep is a uh, Turkish Canadian. She received her PhD or uh, as a, as a Canadian myself, I'm very happy to say that, that she received her PhD here from Queen's University in Kingston and conducted her postdoc research at McGill. Uh, 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 Zeynep has visited Harvard University, Aston University, Oxford European School of Management, Bordeaux University, uh, Tartu School of Management in Estonia, and Renmin University in China. Uh, her work is extremely interesting. She has published widely. Uh, she has been uh, Mm, deservedly decorated. Uh, she has been recognized by numerous awards, including the Tuptak Science Award, which is the highest science award in Turkey. It's like, as Zeynep said, a, a Turkish uh, NSF award. Uh, the APA, um, Ursula Gill's Book Award, uh, the Academy of Management Carolyn Dexter Award, the World Economic Outstanding Young Scientist Award, the Best, Best Book Award in Management and Leadership, uh, CMI. As you see, I have to read here from a list because no human can remember all of these accolades. Um, and you can easily look her up in uh, Google uh, Scholar. I typically get pleasantly envious uh, because her record is fantastic. So please do that after the talk today finishes. Uh, and without further ado, if uh, you allow me to pass the word to Zeynep. Welcome, Zeynep. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Mila, for this wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm really very pleased and honored to be part of this uh, very interesting series. Um, so let me share my screen and uh, tell you the, the story behind the title, if you like. Uh, so if there is anything going wrong, uh, my screen doesn't uh, seem to you or sound, there is a problem, please uh, do let me know, one of the organizers. OK. okay. so. This is, this is the uh, title, What is Wrong with Leader Emergence? Actually, it is based on the um, on our, our kind of obsession, in a way, to, 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 to think about what is wrong with leadership, actually. Uh, not only emergence, but on also leadership in general. Uh, so, um, so we think that perhaps uh, the, the problems that we observe regarding leadership in the world both at the societal political level as well as organizational level may be based on uh, leader emergence, how leaders do emerge. So um, according to the leader emergence literature, uh, the literature focuses on the judgment of group members to nominate a person for the leadership position. Uh, in other words, observers decide who is more like, more leader-like. And this is problematic on two accounts. And hence my subtitle, the leader uh, emergence effectiveness gap and the role of agency. So the first problem is that the characteristics that signal emergence are not the same as those required for leader effectiveness and hence the gap. Uh, this the so-called emergence effectiveness gap may be associated with this functional leadership that we observe and even dark leadership. So that is one. The second problem is that leader emergence literature does not pay sufficient attention to individuals own emotional and motivational states to become a leader. Nobody asks the individual, basically. Uh, in other words, the agency of the individual in this process is, is largely overlooked. So this is because of the underlying implicit assumption that, first of all, everyone aspires to be a leader. So why, you know, why bother asking? Second, a person must already have the motivational and emotional readiness or preparedness to get into the radar of those who perceive them as viable candidates. Uh, but what about those who shy away from leadership? We largely, largely ignore these people and, uh, and undermine mind their, their potential to become perhaps even better leaders than those who emerge. And that's the second part of my talk, as, uh, the, which is the second part of the, of the subtitle. Um, 
so uh, actually uh, that that storyline that i just described is is very nicely summarized by by lanage and hollenbeck uh who says you know in some instances the wrong person might emerge as a leader of a group or the right person may fail to emerge as a leader and i'm going to talk about um the agency issue uh by using two important constructs uh, one is motivation to lead. The right person may fail to emerge because maybe there is a motivational issue uh, behind it. And the second, the construct's name is, is worries about leadership, which is a new one that I, I coined a couple of years ago, a um, couple of years back. So, uh, so the right person may fail to emerge because of these uh, motivational and emotional perhaps barriers. So that's, that's going to be what I'm talking about. Um, so first of all, why, um, let me just try to get this right. What, what if the wrong person emer emerges? What is the consequence of wrong people uh, being perceived as leader-like? Um, it appears that we as perceivers uh, are not doing a terribly good job in, in, in pursue, pursue, pursuing or per, perceiving uh, the potential in, 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 in a person. Um, and um, when we look at the failure rates at the organizational level, managers and, and leaders at the organizational level, uh, the failure rates of, of managers range from 30% to 67% uh, in organizations, averaging 50%, according to research that I just cited. And also we, we hear more uh, and more about darkness of leadership, dark side of leadership, dysfunctional leaders, tyrannic leaders, dark leaders, toxic leaders, abusive leaders, sexism, uh, narcissistic uh, tendencies in leadership. We hear about all of these, uh, these things and, and um, it, it's, it's rather, um, you know, it's not, it's not very uh, un, unlikely to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get, get across these, these types of leaders. For example, 11% of, of, of people who are at the managerial leader, leadership positions in Netherlands are, uh, are uh, documented to be, to be abusive. 13.6% 6, uh, in the US uh, are considered to be dark. Uh, having these traits and what have you, and the cost associated with dark leadership is uh, very high uh, financially as well. So um, leadership, therefore, we can say safely, I think, is in crisis. And as we see in the in the period of pandemic, um, again, I mean, because of the wrongdoings of leaders, uh, some countries are in, in deep trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, the sustainability issues in general is being jeopardized because of, uh, of leadership, um, you know, uh, wrongdoings and what have you. And uh, this report is based on World Economic Forum's um, survey uh, back in 2015. Uh, is there a leadership crisis in the world? And, uh, you know, if you break uh, the, the answers down, according to uh, regions of the world, you see that the majority, actually overwhelming majority of people think that there is a leadership crisis in the world today, like it is back in 2015. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's deepening this, this crisis, leadership crisis, bad leadership uh, is, uh, is, is, is becoming more of a problem uh, today. And uh, parallel to these, you know, public opinions and what have you, as I said, there is growing literature on dark leadership. There is this fantastic book on what is wrong with leadership, uh, Regio's uh, edited book, uh, which uh, kind of documents uh, the gaps in the in the scientific literature of leadership uh, to think uh, to let us think more about uh, the issues uh, that make um, leadership problematic uh, from from the scientific point of view and from the practitioners point of view uh, I like this one they 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 were just published uh, in 2019 both of them why do so many incompetent men become leaders there is an emphasis on on gender here of course and how to fix it but the overall idea is that uh, it's not going well the leadership uh, issues is uh, is is, is uh, really uh, the problems with the leadership issues is deepening 
Okay, so um, with this kind of background, uh, laying the background of, of the, uh, the problem, uh, let's just uh, look um, more um, into the uh, emergence literature. What are the findings uh, of, uh, of, of the scientific literature? This is a meta-analysis uh, from 2011. It's, it's already 10 years old, but um, uh, it's, it's very interesting to, to, to show that. Uh, who people perceive as leader-like uh, are those who are, for example, authoritarian. So uh, as you can see, the, um, the, the, the z-score for authoritarianism in the meta-analysis is very high. Those people who are perceived to be authoritarian are also perceived to be leader-like. Antagonistic, okay, masculine. And at the same time, extroverted, so quite sociable, therefore, intelligent and creative. So these people, we, in other words, we perceive people, we, including ourselves, okay, we perceive people who are masculine, antagonistic, authoritarian, uh, to be leader-like. But at the same time, these people are very sociable, intelligent, and creative. So they are very charismatic, very... Uh, intelligent to influences and what have you lure us uh, into believing that they would be effective leaders and we do um, nominate them or we do vote for them or we, we select them in organizations and what have you. But when you look at the list of qualities or traits that are required for effectiveness, it's a whole different story. But first, again, let us remember uh, the uh, characteristics or qualities of people who emerge as leaders in our eyes, in our perceptions, uh, like that is just, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, scholars uh, write about it. So this is a very brief summary once again. So this is uh, on the one hand side, and then we nominate these people, they become into power, and then, you know, they, they're not effective because for effectiveness, we need competence. Because for emergence, we need, for example, uh, confidence. Uh, so confident appearing individuals. So there is a, there is a mismatch between or we, we think that confident, appearance of confident is competence. That's a very major issue. So competence is needed, team building, team orientedness, humility, even introversion, shyness even. There is some research to suggest that perhaps shy people, introverted people are better leaders because they're better listeners. They give more space to individuals. Uh, they participate others into decision-making and what have you. Excellent interpersonal skills are needed rather than self-promoting, like which is required for emergence. We need people who promote others uh, for effectiveness. Um, absence of dominance is need needed. Absence of assertiveness is needed. Shared leadership is extremely important. Um, and of course, in recent years, this year, last year, uh, after the pandemic, we see that environmental sensitivity is extremely important and crisis management is extremely important. So when you look at uh, these two lists, you see that uh, there is no not not a you know easy transference from the list on the left hand side to the one on the right hand side. I just want to sh uh, read to you a quotation from Luthens in 1988. It's a it's a old one, but it is very important uh, to just remind ourselves that leader emergence is not the same as leader effectiveness. Emergent leaders, i.e. high potentials, specialize in politics, that is organizational politics. Effective leaders specialize in building high performing teams. So we need to really pay more attention to this gap. And these two literature, emergence and, and effectiveness literatures really uh, need to talk uh, uh, to one another uh, more, uh, more frequently and they, they need to work uh, more closely. And organizations as well, they need to uh, mind this gap when they, um, uh, when they uh, have an impression of someone being a good leader. Um, is it an impression or uh, will this person really turn out to be an, an effective uh, individual in the job? Okay. So this is about emergence. And I told you in the first uh, description of the kind of the storyline, I said, you know, what about those who do not emerge? Um, you know, 
having don't have the qualities that I, I just mentioned. So this is the quote that I really like from Epistropaki, who, who talks about self-selection uh, barriers or self-selection bias in leadership, self-selection bias in leadership. Interesting. Talented employees, she says, who are by all accounts successful individual contributors are not willing to step up into managerial position and claim leadership. They're not interested in leadership. And when I talked about it uh, years ago to a number of colleagues, they said, no, no, this is not possible. As I said, the, the overwhelming assumption is that leadership is to be wanted, is to be aspired. Uh, so it's not possible. Uh, people thought it's not possible that people will not uh, step up for this position. Um, and then I come up uh, or, or uh, I, I, I just uh, found out that uh, Harvard uh, did a survey uh, to 2,600, actually 25 full-time employees. It's just a very, um, you know, uh, you know, it's not a proper study as such, but it is just an opinion survey as such. And the question is very simple. Who wants to be promoted into leadership? And the answer is only 34% of the US workers, it says, who aspire uh, to land in leadership roles. And even much smaller numbers, that is 7%, aspired to be in a C-level position, CEO, CFO, CMO, okay, C-level, only 7%. And you can see the breakdown of kind of demographics in this in this uh, question, which is very interesting as well. Um, they also asked about the reasons why uh, some said, or you know, overwhelming majority says, "I'm I'm happy with the role that I have," um, and uh, there are other uh, you know uh, reasons they cite as well. Okay, so therefore, not everybody wants to be a leader. Uh, and we kind of dismiss them, okay? So with respect to the agency of the individual, you know, motivational and emotional preparedness to become a leader, as I said, there are two constructs uh, in the literature. Both are new, but this is uh, already uh, 20 years old. Uh, it's amazing how, how time really flies. Um, Chen and Rusko uh, coined this term, uh, motivation to lead, ML, uh, MTL, uh, to, or to um, openly suggest that leadership is a decision because never before has it been um, conceptualized like this in the, in the emergence literature. Emergence literature never considers an individual's decision or agency. Okay, so uh, the definition of uh, motivation to lead is that it, it affects, the motivation affects leaders or leader to be decision to assume a leadership role and responsibility by getting into the path, by getting uh, trainings on that, by accepting positions, leadership positions and what have you. And this research is already 20 years old. There's a fantastic meta-analysis of the accumulated work on motivation to lead. Uh, and I just cite it here as well. It's uh, published in Journal of Applied Psychology. So when this research is being introduced, I personally got relieved because I have been thinking that it is a decision and nobody asks the individual about, uh, about whether or not uh, he or she wants to become a leader. Um, then I, I see this research is wonderful, but then I thought that, well, it's not enough. One can be very motivated to do something, but there might still be an emotional barrier to keep a person uh, from doing uh, something. Uh, then based on my own personal experiences as well, some leadership positions have been offered to me and I felt uh, motivated, I felt competent to do them, but nevertheless, I felt very um, kind of nervous. Uh, and I said, you know, what's going on? What is the emotional aspect of, of that? And then I, I coined the term uh, uh, worries about leadership to introduce this emotional dimension. So it is an anticipated emotion. It's, it's defined as, as 
you know, thinking about uh, about possible negative consequence, consequences of accepting a leadership role. And it is an anticipated emotion. You think about when the offer, you know, is made or when there is a consideration uh, of you for the for the position, you anticipate the uh, the emotion. Um, um, so economists call it, for example, affective forecast, affective forecast. You do that. And then you think about, so according to this, this concept, there are three dimensions or three aspects of these worries. First of all, it's possible that you worry about performance in the job, in the role, whether or not I can perform well, can I meet the expectations of, of, of people and what have you, while contemplating on that um, decision, on that offer, if there is, a, there is, a, there is an offer materialized. The second worry, emotional kind of worry, might be harm, whether or not, uh, you know, whether or not you're, you're worried to, to harm others with the decisions that you have to make. For example, firing decision is really harming somebody or getting harm yourself, you know, whether or not you will receive harm or give harm to others with, you know, if you become a leader. And finally, uh, you might be worried about work-life balance whether or not your life will be all about leadership and there's no time, no, no energy for, for anything else in your life. Okay, so uh, Wolf shortly worries about leadership is based on three, uh, grounded in three theoretical perspectives. Uh, according to Lazarus's um, appraisal theory of emo emotions, anxiety is rooted in the anticipation of a threatening outcome. And especially when these outcomes pose threat to the satisfaction of the three basic needs that uh, Desi and Ryan uh, talks about in self-determination theory, need for competence, need for relatedness, and need for autonomy. So if there is a, 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 an anticipated threat to these needs, the fulfillment of these needs, then of course the uh, result is an avoidance behavior, behavior or a withdrawal behavior. So for example, not nominating yourself for the job and you know, shying away from the these, uh, these positions. So we, I developed the measure uh, of uh, worries about leadership. Again, it's an anticipated uh, emotion. So to capture that, I said, you know, it's, it starts with a hypothetical um, uh, stem, if you like. Suppose that you're offered a leadership position in your organization. If you accept the leadership position, to what extent the possibility of the following would worry you? What is, what is your anticipated worry, anticipated emotion? So for example, making mistakes, uh, being or, or you know being noticed, your mistakes being noticed more now than before. To what extent this worries you? Or treating employees unfairly. To what extent this worries you? Or this would worry you. Having not enough time for my my friends and my family. To what extent uh, this is a this might be a worry to you? So that is the the measure. And then of course the first thing that we had to do was to validate. Uh, wall, uh, making sure that it is it is something uh, it is it is not just the opposite of motivation, but it is something orthogonal to motivation. Okay, so uh, the valid validation studies, uh, several of them, which have been documented in in Aijan and Shelia, two thousand nineteen. Uh, you know, um, the validation studies included convergence and divergence validation of wall against motivation to lead, which we, which indeed uh, supported that these two constructs are kind of divergent, if you like, uh, at the, at the uh, latent level, they are not correlated. Uh, but simple correlation shows some minor correlation, but at the latent level, uh, they're not correlated, they're orthogonal. Um, whether or not wall uh, measure uh, was associated, correlated with some personality dimensions in the expected direction, yes, it was. Whether or not it was correlated with regulatory focus, uh, prevention focus, promotion focus, yes, it was. And then we ran Physio psychophysiological studies in our leadership lab uh, to show that uh, when people filled in the, the wall questionnaire, wall measure these 16 items, actually their bodily uh, 
reactions, their stress uh, related bodily reactions uh, do change. So for example, there is a correlation with skill con skin conductance, heart rate and heart rate variability, although we tend to miss the significance level, but um, the, you know, the, the correlation is a, in the expected direction. Uh, and indeed, people, uh, people, people's um, anxieties or stress levels or worries increase even physiologically detecta detectable uh, while uh, you know, doing the survey and while thinking about leadership positions, if, if they uh, at all uh, become a possibility. We also le uh, ran lab experiments, quasi field experiments. Uh, they're all uh, documented uh, in this in this uh, paper. Uh, the quasi field experiment was a, a, a lucky coincidence, actually, because at the time uh, we had elections in, in our university for the student council. So before the elections, before the voting has started, I was able to give motivation to lead and uh, worries about leadership questionnaires to the students who were candidates for uh, the uh, student council at Koch University. And after the election, we were able to correlate the election results with the uh, scores, uh, wall and MTL scores of, of the candidates. And indeed, we found out that uh, wall predicted uh, election results above and beyond MTL. So there was incremental predictive validity that we uh, were able to find. So these two constructs are extremely important and they seem to complement each other, apparently. Uh, and this is a new line of research. So we, we, we constantly uh, investigate different things. And one of the things that we investigate is whether or not wall correlates with leadership nomination of the self by, by self, self-nomination and nomination by others, whether or not people also, uh, you know, uh, people also, uh, there's less likelihood of, of others to nominate someone with high worries. Is it, is it a possibility? And we found that, that it is a possibility that, uh, you know, higher worries would increase self, I'm sorry, decrease self-nomination as well as nomination by others. Uh, there is an interesting twist to that, but if we have time, I will also talk about that there's a gender difference there. But by and large, this is what we found, and this is this paper is under review right now. And finally, uh, whether or not wall is associated with leader effectiveness, because motivation to lead has already been shown to be uh, associated with uh, transformational leadership, LMAX, and what have you. But wall, uh, it's a new uh, type of research. Uh, we don't have much to 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 speak about, but we have some research to indicate that this is very interesting. To indicate that medium levels of wall, medium levels of worry. Uh, a, is associated with leader effectiveness. And what I, I mean by leader effectiveness is lack of abusive uh, behaviors uh, and uh, satisfaction with leadership or uh, different uh, effective leadership behaviors uh, rated by uh, followers uh, was associated with uh, medium levels of wall. So very high level of wall, like a lot of you know the high level of anxiety is not good for leader effectiveness and low level of anxiety like saying that you know i'm not worried about my performance i'm not worried about harming others i don't care i'm not worried about work life balance then this is also not associated with leader effectiveness so a medium level there is a sweet spot that needs to be found for wall uh, to become for 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 leaders to become uh, effective if they have uh, a wall okay so is there a gender uh, and, and culture effect? Uh, when I was you know, thinking, contemplating on this, this research program, I, just, I was just zapping uh, the TV one morning and I come across uh, Christiana Manpour's uh, program. And she was, Christian was um, interviewing with a, um, a politician actually, a women politician, Harriet Harman. Uh, she uh, was the longest um, serving uh, 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 um, member of the parliament, of the UK parliament. Uh, so she, is she was extremely competent in terms of the uh, experience and uh, the tenure uh, in the job and what have you. Uh, she's in the Labour uh, Party. Uh, but then 
uh, when, uh, when it was offered to become the leader of the Labour Party, uh, something happened. And this, this interview, just one minute, uh, to, is, is about the moment uh, of uh, receiving a, an offer uh, to, to think about uh, becoming a leader of the uh, Labour Party. Okay, let's watch together. I hope you will, uh, you will hear it well. So, women can't hack it as MPs. So let me ask you then, because I, I'm interested as to why you didn't throw your name in for, for leadership. Well, it is a bit baffling to me because when Gordon Brown stood down as leader of the Labour Party after we'd lost the 2010 elections, suddenly I was catapulted into being leader of the Labour Party, acting leader. And there was an election underway. And during that time, I was doing Prime Minister's questions opposite David Cameron. I was responding to the budget debate opposite George Osborne. I was responding to the Queen's speech, you know, the government's legislative programme. And I was doing everything. And all the members of the Labour Party around the country are saying, why aren't you standing for leader? And somehow I absorbed it as a compliment and very... I'm sorry? ...gratifying, but it didn't get into my head that I should seriously think about doing it. But um, you just put your finger on the weak spot in the women's movement. So many people say that that is, that is our problem, that we don't think that we should be running for leadership, even though, even though you could do it and you proved it 20 times backwards. Well, when I look around and when I talk to my friends and colleagues, I'm always saying to them, you know what, there's so many men who are not up to the job who put themselves forward and there's so many women like you who are up to the job who don't get your backside in there. But when it came to that moment, I was one of those who was not taking sort of advice that I give out to do other people. Do you regret it today, especially when you see where your party is today? Well, I think in a way that I don't sort of have a regret mode in my mental makeup. I think probably I would have got elected if I'd have run for it, but who knows? I might have been rubbish doing it, you know? It's like, yeah. I don't think so. You know, you so she, she doesn't know what happened actually, but when, the mom, when that moment came, she was not able to do it. So there is, there is something keeping people and maybe women more uh, so than men, keeping them, uh, keeping them from uh, getting into the job. And indeed, uh, when we look at the uh, data across uh, seven countries, uh, just, just across countries, uh, just making a gender difference or gender comparison, we do see that there is a significant, uh, significant difference uh, in both motivation to lead, a significant difference between genders in both motivation to lead, as well as worries about leadership and in the kind of the anticipated dimension, uh, direction. In other words, uh, men uh, do have uh, more uh, motivation to lead and women do have more worries about leadership. And of course, this needs to be investigated more uh, for sure. So when we looked at the gender and country or effect, I cannot say culture right now because country context um, is more than culture. Uh, legislation, legislations or educational system and opportunities and what have you, organizational structures may differ. So it's not only culture, but we will try to understand the effect of culture, namely values and norms as well. But for now, let me just say uh, that, uh, you know, let me just stick to the, to the concept country rather than culture. So we find out that there is a, a main effect of gender in, uh, in the data set that we have uh, for these countries uh, that you can see in the slide, there is a main effect of gender, there is a main effect of country, okay? Uh, there are uh, cross-country differences, cross-gender differences, but there is no interaction effect of gender and country. And we're still investigating what is going on there. So when we look at the motivation to lead how the countries are uh, are, are, are uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, ranking in a way, uh, we see that overall, again, men uh, have higher motivation to lead than, than women do. Uh, there are some country differences. Uh, I, I did compute um, uh, uh, postdoc uh, comparisons by using Tuki. And then in, in, the, in the next slide, I'm gonna show you the kind of the grouping of the countries from the highest uh, ranking to the lowest ranking in a minute, if you just bear with me. Uh, 
because this is way too complicated to make sense out of. But the trend is, uh, is interesting. And as I said, the worries about leadership, women uh, are higher than men, um, except for uh, maybe China, but that is not even significant. Uh, and when we look at the, as I said, kind of the quick and dirty grouping of countries, we can see that from the highest to the lowest, uh, the, the, the order is such that China and Turkey seems to have a highest score. These are all from employees, by the way. China and Turkey has the highest score of motivation to lead. Then comes South Korea and US, then France and Germany, and the lowest score, uh, relatively speaking, is Japan. And in terms of worries about leadership, the highest uh, highly worried countries, if you like, are South Korea and Turkey, then comes France and Germany, then comes the US, and the lowest worry score belongs to uh, Japan and China. So as you can see, um, motivation to lead and worries about leadership are not mirror images to one another. So for example, Japan is low, both in motivation to lead, as well as in worries about leadership. So, you know, and this is the same for individuals. An individual may be low in both, high in both, high in, high in one uh, construct, low on the other and vice versa. Um, China, uh, in terms of motivation to lead the highest, but uh, worries about leadership, the lowest and, and what have you. So of course we need to make sense out of all this and we're in the process of, of doing that. But uh, some uh, qualitative interviews or analyses help us to maybe make some sense out of it, uh, thanks to uh, a former uh, master's student of my mine, uh, Malina's uh, work here. So uh, some interviews, some, some excerpts from the interviews I want to share with you, uh, just to make sense uh, out of why some Asian countries, uh, some Asian countries meaning Japan, China, and South Korea, uh, behave differently, if you like, okay? What are the differences among them? Um, only uh, qualitative analyses or, or interviews can tell us that. So some observations here. Japanese do not want to become leaders, especially in comparison to Koreans, and that's what uh, quantitative data shows as well, who are a lot more competitive and motivated to assume leadership positions, they say. So a, an observer, a senior manager uh, can detect uh, that difference. Japanese society has been giving weight to consensual decision making and found less importance of leadership for at least uh, for uh, 150 years and hasn't adopted the elite education system. So Japanese people tend to find importance of followership instead of leadership and evaluate the spirit of service and sense of duty. So that may, may highlight the difference between Japan and, well, the, 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 the Japan's uh, low motivation as well as low worry about leadership. All South Koreans want to be leaders because it only has advantages and Koreans co care about money and status and this is what they get in the leadership position, says a university student in Korea. Some more quotations before I end. In Europe, uh, a Chinese professional says, I think personality and affinity to lead and control other people has a bigger influence on who would actually accept a leadership position than in China. Because in China, people rarely decline leadership positions because they want the reward and benefits which they would uh, get from it. Again, similar to the uh, situation or description of Korea. In Korea, it's easier for me to lead because I get more respect from my employees. A German expatriate says, in Germany, typically managers work more hours uh, than their employees. They definitely have a tough job. But here in Korea, I think the manager has, has a lot of freedom and apparently has a lot of benefits out of leadership. And finally, a Chinese professional talks about worries, worries about work-life balance. He says worries about work-life balance, uh, or maybe she, uh, imbalance plays a smaller role in China because people do not fear not having time for their families when they take a leadership position because they know that taking the leadership position will benefit their family financially. And this is more important than spending time for themselves or with them even. Uh, 
Okay, financial security is more important than spending time with the family. Interesting. So we're trying to understand more about these cross-country, cross-cultural differences. But just to conclude, uh, and we will, of course, update you uh, in the literature, you can see what's going on on, on this front. But for now, let me just um, uh, point out a few uh, conclusions and uh, future direction. Uh, I like this, this quotation by, by Fardik. Uh, he says, a sustainable future is co-created with leaders who lead with others rather than over others. So in the classical emergence literature or classical approaches to leadership, there is this one person, usually male, uh, giving uh, orders, controlling everyone, making decisions unilaterally almost. Uh, but this model needs to change if you want a sustainable future, uh, he says. Therefore, we need to mind the gap between emergence and effectiveness. We need to be very careful about who we nominate for leader uh, for leadership positions because they tend not to turn out to be effective ones, especially effectiveness in today's terms is defined by participation, uh, shared leadership, environmental sensitivity, and crisis management uh, by by teams by others. We need to also pay attention to the agentic pathways. So who does not emerge? Uh, for these positions and why are they hiding? What is, what, should we not be really paying attention to them? Perhaps they would become better leaders um, if, they, if they take the position. How can we support them? What is the leadership culture, organizational culture that creates the same type of uh, dominant, arrogant, antagonistic, um, male dominated or masculine type of leaders? What is in this culture that perpetuates this, this, this type? Uh, which is not uh, always effective. And finally, future research should investigate the optimum level of wall and optimum level of uh, motivation to lead for leader effectiveness. I don't believe that uh, there is a linear relationship between motivation and effectiveness. Uh, for leadership positions, at least, wanting it so much may also be damaging, I think. I mean, one should be suspicious about those people who want it so much, who are so motivated to do it. I think we need to be suspicious about too much of uh, motivation as well, and too little. Again, there is an optimum level, there is a sweet spot uh, when we talk about motivation, as well as uh, worries, of course. A little bit of a, a healthy level of worry uh, I think uh, my hunch, of course, it needs to be empirically uh, tested over and over again, is good for leader effectiveness. You can see uh, what's going on in this uh, line of research uh, by uh, maybe visiting uh, our, our um, webpage, uh, or not webpage, actually, the Open Access Journal of Frontiers in Psychology. We have a special issue edited by myself, Mustafa and Kim Yin. Chen, who is the creator of the Motivation to Lead construct. Uh, three of us uh, is in the process of uh, putting together a special issue on this very topic. Uh, we already have uh, four or five uh, articles uh, accepted, uh, made available uh, to everyone and, and more is to come. And finally, I would like to thank uh, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of beautiful people. This, this wonderful group uh, that you see uh, are my, my uh, dear graduate students. Uh, three of them in the front uh, are, are already graduate. I cited some of their work in my presentation and the rest are, are uh, current members. And the supporters of our research and supporters of my students are also deeply uh, appreciated. I want to uh, uh, you know, cite them as well in this slide. And I would also like to uh, mention uh, the financial support by the uh, chair position that I have and uh, to be tucked the, the Turkish NSF, uh, like uh, uh, Mila was saying. Thank you very much for, for your kind attention. Thank you so very much, Zeynep. I think if we were in a room, there'll be a loud burst of applause, but you can just imagine that. Uh, so thank, thank you. you for that great presentation. 
Um, I did forget to mention in my duties as a host uh, to use the Q&A and I've been sending messages and I already have a few very thoughtful questions. I would encourage the rest of you, if you have questions to send them along, we will decidedly not have time to reply to all of them, but we can send them to Zainab and I'm sure that will help uh, in her future in her future Absolutely. work but let me let me ask you some of the questions that did come up and uh, i'll begin sort of narrow and then go a bit wide um there was a very interesting question that asked about whether uh wall is more trait like or more state like absolutely yes this is the, this is one of the questions that we struggle in our lab um the research we have is is going on but we have the um uh, we have a, um, what am I trying to say? We have a uh, tendency to see it as a state-like because um, you may have worries about leading for your university. You may, you may be worried about becoming a dean, for example, for a particular leadership position, you may be worried, but for another position like department head or um, a president of your uh, association, for example, vocational association, you may feel very good about it, okay? So it depends on to what extent that position, and each position may be different, that position poses a threat to your need for competence, need for related, mm -hmm. need for autonomy. So we have mm -hmm. a tendency to think that it's a state, but the, you know, we're, we, we go on. So might you then presumably have different levels of wall uh, in terms of different positions? So to be department chair versus to be dean, like exactly. they, I could, okay. Exactly. Okay, so within within individual difference, we, we anticipate or we expect uh, in our research, which is going on. Uh, there was another sort of more constructive question, uh, and that had to do with the dimensionality of it. So yeah. is uh, what you presented sort of set in stone? Could there potentially be other dimensions? So I'm in a large bureaucratic organization. Why bother? Because I'm not going to be able to accomplish anything. So could that be a dimension? Like, could you speak a little bit to how you came to the dimensionality uh, of the construct and if that's sort of solid? Well, it's not set in stone. It's already been published, but or you, we we can always revisit our our cons, concepts and dimensions and all that. Uh, why bother? Is I think low worry. I mean, it would it would represent itself mm -hmm. low worry. I think I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't I wouldn't worry because I don't care uh, about that organization. One of my graduate students is now uh, trying to understand whether or not organizational fairness uh is associated with wall because if you don't think that you know the organization is treating you fairly and others fairly then you don't care you have low affective commitment and therefore uh um uh high level of uh, or maybe low level of wall i mean that may be represented in the level of wall and my expectation mm -hmm. is to be to be low rather than high in that case because you don't, you're not worried therefore Okay, thank you. Then another question that sort of, you know, it's it's sort of popped up in leadership literature. Are we, when we talk about these issues, are we, uh, uh, I'm going to read from the question here, are we conflating leadership with organizational rank? So you could potentially be a leader without having any formal responsibility, oh, right? Absolutely. So uh, uh, to what extent, you know, sort of what of that are these constructs more relevant to? To formal positions, to formal positions formal position so there, there's some hope yes exactly exactly yes uh yes it is it is very relevant it is relevant it is defined for former pos formal positions rather than informal uh leadership yeah but question whether or not people uh in informal positions whether or not people have the same uh type of worries is an interesting is an interesting question but this is for formal positions in organizations okay all right. Uh, then our next question had to do with, uh, uh, I guess, how do we get people to uh, sort of not have such high high wall? And there, there there's several permutation of permutations of it. Uh, one of the questions had to do with. Our move to flatter organizations, uh, that question comes from Martha Misnevsky that uh, you, you would know, Zainab. Uh, are we losing opportunities for people to learn about leadership in small steps? 
is the high hierarchy organizations in hierarchy organizations it's not unusual for a junior manager to have just one to three subordinates uh, and it's inefficient from an organizational perspective maybe it decreases innovation but it seems it would help people learn to lead i'm just this is all martha's words i want to give her proper yeah. credit here uh, yeah. and therefore possibly be less afraid to take on a leadership role so what's a what's a happy medium you know Right. Uh, so organizational context, right? I mean, some of some of the things I missed because of the connection, I think. But can you just summarize the context that Martha is talking about? By the way, hi, Martha. The question. Uh, it's basically if you're in a flat organization, so you don't flat. have the opportunity okay. to learn in steps. So what do right. we do about that? Is, ah, does okay, it have perfect. an impact? And okay, yeah. so so you just you just take a step at at the group level, at the team level, at the project level, right? Mm -hmm. So, for, you know, um, flat organizations tend to be project based organizations and, you know, why not take leadership in those in those uh, projects, cross functional teams or uh, agile teams and what have you, which is which is a, still a big um, uh, responsibility. Uh, so you can practice, you can practice leadership, you can practice uh, or be reflective of your wall uh, while you're you're engaged in leadership in those uh, small, but nevertheless, very important uh, projects. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very good thought. And I, I shared with you earlier that, you know, there was a, a, a conversation began on a, on a group uh, that I belong to, and uh, someone encouraged uh, women from our academic uh, women group to attend this talk. Uh, and learn uh, what we can so that we as women, sort of speaking to the gender effect, uh, do step up and sort of reduce our, our sort of any anxiety about leadership. But if you mm. can speak in a broader sense as educators, uh, do we have a role to play with these constructs, if you wish, uh, to encourage our, our students uh, to um, uh, to to reduce their wall and um, so that they can step up to positions people that typically would not emerge as per the um, early slides of your presentation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we can. I think we can. And one of the things that we have to fight, especially for with, with women, is um, perfectionism. I think perfectionism okay. that we need to uh fight with fight in the in the sense that you know we need to really work on it work on it uh and fear of failure basically and this is a very old line of research unfortunately fear of failure fear of success by the way which is the uh same um, um the, the other side of the same coin fear of fear of failure and fear of success are are basically the same uh, two sides of the same coin uh we need to uh, really uh work with women uh, to experience actually, like it's like an exposure therapy, experience failure and reflect on their feelings, reflect on um, their, their perceptions and uh, just yeah, maybe have specialized program not to uh, didactically teach them what to do, mm -hmm. let them experience it, okay? Yeah. So for, and promote failure in a way promote learning from failure, promote sharing failures with one another. For example, there is a fantastic CV on, on the internet from a Princeton, Princeton professor, uh, and the CV is about failures. You know, how many papers that he rejected, how many grants have been turned down, how many times he received a bad student evaluations and what have you. Let us just publicly share them, not maybe, I mean, this is, of course, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, through Google, but share with, like, tell each other stories of failures. I always tell my students whenever my paper is rejected, I tell my lab that my paper is rejected, you know, so what? Um, a role model, you know, being a role model, not only with your successes, but also mm -hmm. with failures and how you how you take those failures i think is a major thing okay uh i that reminds me of when we were graduate students that will tell everybody how old i am we received rejection letters and paper 
uh, rejection letters for jobs, rejection letters for journals. And we had a wall of shame where everybody had to put a, not had to, everybody had them. So we just took them out and it was a really liberating experience. So I don't think you can do that with email these days, but I'm sure uh, young tech savvy people will find a way to find a way to share failure. Uh, But I think it's certainly uh, interesting. And it's, it's, it's something I would share in class, for example, because I think awareness is, is the, is the first step to that. Um, even though another question comes to me here, and it has to do, uh, we, we have been aware of some of these issues. So the interview you put up, you know, this is five years old. So why isn't anything changing, Zainab? So we have uh, maybe not studied this um, in such uh, in in a uh, uh, in such rigorous ways. I think you have uh, done fanta- fantastic work. It's easy to communicate. It's easy to grasp. But that basic idea that certain people and it's gender. But let me emphasize, it's not just gender, right? I mean, we, oh, yeah, we yeah. talked about cultural differences, racial uh, differences as well, perhaps. Uh, and uh, um, you you were also talking about difference between LGBTQ folk and everybody else. Yeah. So it, it wouldn't be just gender. We focused on gender for the purposes of this, but it's not just that. No. But we have had that broad awareness that certain groups for one reason or another are are simply not stepping up. Why has that not changed? And do you see it changing in the future? If we look into the future to end on an optimistic note, do you have optimism? I am. I have optimism. Of course, Mila, I do have optimism because, I mean, you see, uh, you, you see the, you know, women's movement, you see the movement of, you know, African-Americans and what have you. I mean, you see how long <laughs> it yeah. takes uh, for the wheel to move in a way, but it does move. I, I, I am an, I'm an, uh, you know, a hopeless uh, uh, optimist, uh, if you <laughs> Uh, I do hope, uh, yes, and it will change. I think because uh, I mean I, I've see, I've sh- uh, shown you uh, books like you know what I mean what a daring title you know why are so many men are incompetent men in leadership position? This is published by by Harvard Business uh, uh, Publication and what have you a very prominent. Uh, a uh, speaker or a consultant wrote this book and what have you, male actually. So yeah, I mean, we're now talking about masculinities and femininities in leadership rather than male and female, okay? Masculine and feminine qualities in leadership. And that is quite doable. If you don't say male, female, like, you know, to, to kind of agitate anyone, but if you, if you promote femininity in leadership, if you promote shared leadership, more empowering leadership, these things, you know, uh, then um, one thing that I'm not very optimistic about is the way we perceive people as leader-like. We continue, because mm-hmm. it, um, evolutionary uh, uh, roots, unfortunately, we tend to see dominant people, masculine people, arrogant people, uh, antagonistic people, bullies, okay, to be more leader-like, unfortunately. And that is uh, that is governed by our amygdala, a limbic system. That is why it's, it's rather difficult to penetrate to that uh, part of the brain. But I'm sure by reprogramming, re- uh, uh, telling news stories and uh, mm. being aware of, of all of these things, I think uh, it will change. It will. It, it has to change. Yeah, it's certainly highlighting. That was a very powerful slide that talked about who emerges and who's effective. Um, I think that's something we should uh, we should broadcast to the world more, perhaps. Exactly. Well, I am very very sad that we have hit the formal end time um, of this particular presentation. That doesn't mean the conversation has to end. Um, uh, you will be able to access this presentation again, and of course, uh, visit uh, as, uh, visit Zainab's work. She has uh, shown us some great resources. I have seen that 10 new questions have trickled in since you and I started talking. I do apologize for not be, being able to respond them live, but we will send them to Zainab. And I'd like to conclude by thanking uh, Zainab uh, primarily. Thank you so much for an insightful My presentation. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and, um, Everyone involved this morning, uh, we had over 110 attendees uh, from judging from the names from uh, many places around the world. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day, evening, or, you know, a restful night of sleep. And we will see you in uh, three short weeks. Uh, Thank you, everyone.